go through our church life and our church community. Um, we might just pray now, I might just pray now if that's okay. Lord, <coughs> as we come into your word today, Father, we ask that you will speak to our hearts. Lord, um, Lord, take away the distractions, take away the things that will rob each of us of the opportunity to hear from you today. Lord, we thank you that uh, we have a church family, Lord, that we have an opportunity to get together. Lord, and some countries don't have that. They, Lord, have to do all sorts of um, ways of getting around their governments. But, Lord, their desire to worship you is nonetheless, and, Lord, ours is also nonetheless today. Lord, we want to worship in your word. Lord, speak to us, we pray. And, Father, in these things I ask, as always, Father, the words I speak will be your words and not mine. Amen. Well, folks, um, I'm not sure what's up on the screen today, and I've got to look at both screens. I'm in an unenviable position today to speak passionately about Scripture and have a sermon of teaching, but also to introduce a bit of a change to the life of the church. And I don't want to be a lecture because part of me says, okay, get the facts out and do it this way, and the other part says, let the Holy Spirit speak. And so I've got a little battle going on inside me. But I was wondering, when you see the words church life, what do you think? What pops into your mind? This can be a rhetorical question. It's not necessarily participative. I was just wondering that when we look at, uh, you would have heard last week, we announced that we're going to do an integrated study about Romans. And I'll talk about that a little bit later on. It's about doing life groups a little bit differently, or home groups a little bit differently. That's one aspect of church life. But I wonder when you think about church life, I had a bit of a think and popped down. This is not the ex exclusive list. Um, it's not limited. But these are the ones that I came across. And the ones that I came across were these sorts of things. So basically communication, prayerful, encouraging, personal, gracious, accountable, supportive, familiarity, discipleship, challenging, and worship. Put your hand up if you experience 100% of those things here. Oh, okay. Let's not go there because no one put their hand up. Is everyone all right this morning? You know, I find this new setup really intri intriguing. It's almost like if you sit in the yellow seats, you can't lift your hands. If you sit in the blue seats, you're a bit more tense to lift your hands. Put your hand up if you experience one of those things here. All right, I'm going to stop there. I'm not going to ask for two, three, four, or five. <laughs> I'm hoping it's got the whole lost co lot covered. Folks, when we enter into something changing in the life of the church, sometimes we're fearful that that's going to change how we can relate to God and how we can communicate with Him and feel His sense of presence. Churches change over time. They change in demographic. They change in the focus. The gospel's always the same. But churches can change. The danger we have in the 21st century is either going too far with what the world is doing and not enough about God, or so far into ourselves we worry and we protect that we don't allow for growth and God to work. And in the life of the church, things have to change. The gospel stays the same. And this happens when we look at these key features in church, is that when our church starts to get larger, some of us become fearful that we lose some of those things. And it's called church life. Our church is about the size of what is called a family church, family church. Basically, we know nearly everybody in the church. We know what's going on in their private business. Oh, sorry, we share each other's life. We don't gossip, and we know what's going on. We share birthdays and things. We know when someone's sick, and we provide for them in pastoral care. When a church starts to change size and change its dynamic a little bit, it goes to a thing called a group's church. This is just names that some person's pulled up and, and worked through. In a group church, then, you lose a little bit of the family, but then you've got to think, how do we transition? One of the ways to do that so effectively and lose none of the things on the screen is through life groups. It's being involved in a group other than the Sunday morning service, other than worship on Sunday, is an opportunity to say, let's meet together and keep contact, let's encourage. We're going to look at that as we go through. just want to plant that in your mind because God is doing great things in the valley. And he's doing things differently here than he's done before. Now, you might say, well, that's good or that's bad, but God is still doing it. 
I want to encourage you with that because this is about the life of the church and church life. So as we open up our Bibles and we have a look at Romans building a community of faith, some great stuff came out of this. I'll just read the first, um, first seven or six, first seven um, verses. It says here, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. You know, everywhere, whenever you read Holy Scriptures, do you think of the New Testament or the Old Testament? Or do you think of the whole Bible? Think of both, yeah. When Paul wrote this letter to the Romans, he was referring to the Old Testament because that was their Holy Scriptures. And yet he still talks about the gospel of Jesus. And so there's got this message coming through regarding his son, who he has a human nature, was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with the power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him and for his namesake we receive grace and apostleship to, be, to call people from among the Gentiles to obedience to come to faith. And you also are among those who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the introduction to Romans as our integrated study and the introduction to our life groups. So there's two messages coming through. They're sort of connected together, and I prayerfully have been praying I do them well to give, to do it justice, so to speak. A couple of things about history. I love history. You might have picked that up over the years. But as we look at church history, what comes to mind is that Paul put quill the parchment about 56 AD. Now, this was before he actually went to Rome at the end of Acts. So he didn't... It wasn't the other way around, some people think. And, and up. so this was happened long before. Paul hadn't actually been there yet. He hadn't been into this place. Um, he was writing to the Christians there in Acts. The start of Acts, it talks about some of the Christians or some of those from faith were from Rome, had come at, the, at Pentecost. Christianity was already in Rome before Paul was there. Theologians and historians don't know how that was. Because we know Paul went around Asia Minor and Turkey planting churches everywhere. Home churches, about, there was about 8,000 believers in Rome, the city of Rome at the time, which is about 4% of the population. I wonder what our poor percentage of the population would be in Gatton of believers. There was home churches, there were a few synagogues operating because the Jews were very strong, but there was lots of home churches. And the great thing about the book of Romans, as it's impacted through history, Augustine of Hippo, became a Christian when he read Romans. It so impacted his life. He was one of the early church writers back in the second century. And then following through history, Martin Luther, we know the story of the, of the Reformation where he brought, he, his desire was to bring the word to the people. So translating it from Latin into German so that common people could read it, not just the clergy, which caused a big rift in the Catholic Church of the time. John Wesley came to faith through reading Romans. And of course, at, at the last one is Karl Barth, who also was deeply impacted. So you see, when we read Romans, things happen. When people approach the gospel through Romans, things happen. Have you heard of the Roman road? The Roman road. And it's a, a basically, as Paul goes through and writes this letter to the people of Rome, he lays out the steps about finding faith. He lays out the reality of mankind and humanity. When we put those things together, we come up with this wonderful message throughout the whole book of Romans. It's not about a closed universe. It's not about something quiet up there that you can't aspire to. It brings us down to us. When we look at Romans also, God is breaking into this world and enlarging opportunities and Luke spoke about that before just in when we do offering and th that approach to what God provides it outside of what we have my prayer is that as we and Darren's prayer as we sat and worked through this as elders is that as the church moves through Romans that you'll be inspired and impacted by that it'll create 
more spiritual opportunities within your life. Is that right, Darren? Or are we just doing this to fill in time, till the next state of origin? No. <laughs> I have to tell you a story about that. We had an elders meeting on Wednesday night. That's how spiritual down we are, man. <laughs> Even though our sign says, pray for New South Wales if you want to. <laughs> it was totally my fault. I'd forgotten about state of origin, go figure. And Darren, being compliant, said, yes, Doug, I'll be there. Comes in with his state of origin jersey on. And I said, oh, state of origin on tonight, isn't he? He said, yeah, can we make this a short meeting? <laughs> so, Darren, this is the life of the church. I try to make it short. The message in Romans that Paul brings through is God and humanity, heaven and earth, the eternal and temporal, the visual and the invisible, all come to revelation. Are you inspired yet? Are you excited yet? Are you thinking, hey, this is going to be awesome? Or are you going, oh, please? Or you stop talking? One of the things about our um, integrated studies I'm going to ask you to do is think about who you can invite to a life group. The groups aren't closed. I've got a list up on the wall of leaders and hosts, home hosts and leaders, and I've contacted nearly all of them. There's a couple I've just got to nail down today before they go home to make sure they're right. Be prepared for an invitation. Even though you go to one group already, be prepared to be invited to another because you never know what God might teach you in a new group. Don't you go sitting there going, oh, no, I'm in a group already. No, <laughs> let God work on you. This is about breaking through our humanity, heaven and earth, the eternal, the temporal, visual and invisible. Paul uses some key words too at the start of this, and I find this fascinating because I love the way the Greek comes out and explodes things out. The word doulos means servant. We're all familiar with that, aren't we? Remember the ship called the Doulos? I remember as a young person going down to the Doulos. Now, Doulos means servant. It also means bond servant. And Paul writes these words today. And I've written it up on the screen so you can ponder about it and just see if it applies to you as well. Intention to assert his exclusiveness to Christ. Do you call yourself a servant of Jesus? Does everything else pushed out of the road because you're a servant of Jesus? Or do you walk with a foot in both camps? He also says it in understanding this way is an allegiance to God's absolute sovereignty. That's a word that's found its way into my lexicon of recently. And um, the past 12 months, it keeps popping up to me, sovereignty and sovereign. It's in my daily journals. It's in my prayer. And I keep thinking to myself, to have someone so powerful and so over everything and yet still talk to me is quite humbling and quite encouraging. You see, folks, when we enter into the throne room, which I'm going to use as a catchphrase, hashtag Team Street, when we enter into the throne room, we come into his presence of his sovereignty. As mighty as he is, he speaks to us. And through the book of Romans, it comes clearer and clearer through Paul's words that this is a God of the universe which speaks into the personal life of each person. Who could you invite to life group with you? Who's someone you could reach out to and say, hey, look, we're doing this for six weeks. It's only six weeks and it's on every such and such a day, whatever time your leader dis dis um, decides. And we're going to do this. I think it would be really good just to touch base. After six weeks, you're all right, you're fine. It doesn't matter where you are geographically. Make it work. I'm going to talk about some strategies about that little moment. And, the one and then he talks about being an apostle. And the apostle is one who was sent to preach the gospel and plant churches. An apostle is someone who's sent to preach the gospel and plant churches. It's a person not to make big numbers because it makes them feel like they're important. It's about the kingdom of God. Do you know how many home groups we have in our church at the moment? Three. Margaret Neal's, Basil's and Rick Liz's, and Shree's and mine. Are we doing the kingdom any good? Can I encourage you that there's seven names up on the board? Hopefully there'll be nine by the end of today that you'll fit in somewhere that you'll make the commitment for six weeks to see the kingdom change, 
because that's what we want to see happen. We don't want to say, oh, Gatton Baptist Church has got all these groups happening. We want to say that, God, you're doing great stuff. We want to be part of that and learn. So how does that come about? Well, you know that I love to work in shapes in Word. I'm so all over technology. If we have a look at the life group, in life groups, or in home groups, not everyone's the same, yeah? Everyone has a different shape and a different understanding of God. And they all join in to make the one group. They all take their little bits and pieces and they add them in there. Rick Warren, when he was doing, setting up things for Purpose Driven Life and the home group situation there, life group situation there, he said in every group there'll be an EGR. That's a person that's extra grace required. That's one that's just going to be that little bit person you need to keep working on. And he said, sit in your group and look around and see if you can find out who the EGR is. And he said, if you can't find that person, it's you. It doesn't matter if there's 14 EGRs in a group. It does matter that you're in the group learning and growing together. We have all different shapes and size. We put things in there. And of course, that then reflects upon the life of the church life and how it fits. We have all the different life groups around the church all coming together. At the end of six weeks, and Darren and I have only just touched on this, we're going to have a celebration of our six weeks together. We're going to bring all the life groups together and you'll all be able to preach a bit of a sermon out of Romans. So, oh, did I put you off? Some people are going, oh, I'm not going to be part of that. No way, man. We'll have some sort of a celebration there just to say, well, hey, God, we've, we've been drawn into this and we really appreciate what you've taught us in that time. Folks, because of these different aspects, it teaches me that God is sovereign. He looks over all of our church life. He looks at each person here and says, hey, this is something that's going to be great for you. And I love you and I want you to grow. Okay, so the four aspects. And... Um, going to work through these and I hope that you'll be challenged, entertained and totally mesmerised. The first one is spiritual food. A local newspaper had a Sunday morning religion section that contained many other things, letters and edit to the editor about various religious issues. Most weeks these letters were pretty in innocuous but on one Sunday someone, something sorry, was printed that became quite controversial. This is back before we had Facebook and, and, s and internet media. I quit going to church this year. I decided that listening to sermons week after week was stupid, a stupid thing to do. After all, I went to church for more than 40 years, and during my life, I probably heard 5,000 sermons. I can only remember about five of them. What a waste of time. Signed, bored, and busy. This sparked the fury of incoming letters. Some people wrote that sermons do make a difference. Others said that bored and busy's opinion that they were basically meaningless and unnecessary. Finally, one letter was printed that ended the debate. I quit eating this year. Thanks to bored and busy's insights, I've decided that eating week after week was a stupid thing to do. After all, I've been eating more, uh, been eating for more than 40 years, and during that lifetime, I probably had 5,000 meals. I can only remember about five of them. What a waste of time. <laughs> Signed, starved and stupid. <laughs> Being in the life group is an opportunity to have spiritual food differently. It's great that we come together and we, you know, the message that God brings us from the front and inspires us hopefully for the week, but we're not just one hit wonders, are we? We walk with God daily. And for these six weeks, my prayer is that you'll be involved in a life group because it has spiritual food. It'll be real about what your diet is lacking. You'll be able to come into the group and say, and even if you don't say anything, just sit there and listen and see what's happening. And you can always say to yourself, hmm, okay, Lord, I'll write that one down. You don't have to do sell anybody. Just write it down and, and have a think about it and pray about it. You'll seek nourishment. In 1 Corinthians 3, 2, Paul writes to the Corinthian church, I give you milk, not solid food, for you are not ready yet for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. When we're in that situation in the spiritual milk, I've found in our home group, which is predominantly young adults, I never cease to amaze at the sense of revelation. 
We read through a passage of scripture, and w- as we always do, and I'll say, has anyone got anything that comes out of that for them? You know, we spend probably the next half an hour, 45 minutes, pulling apart that passage, don't we? Please nod. People are watching us. <laughs> because Revelation speaks through people. The Holy Spirit speaks through us into his word. And so stuff happens like that. It gives us a sense of reading God's word together. Mighty things happen when people pray together. Mighty things happen when people read God's word together. So that's the first one, spiritual food. Increase your diet. The second one is being like CPR. When Gordon accepted the youth position at his local church, he learned that the job required CPR training, reluctantly signed up for the class offered. Gordon felt a little uncomfortable in the class, but decided to make, it th- make the best of it. When things got a little boring, he entertained the class and irritated the instructor with a few jokes. Even though he didn't take the instruction seriously, he managed to pass the CPR exam. He became a certified lifesaver. There was very little confidence in his ability to actually save someone's life. A few weeks later, Gordon was driving to work when he witnessed a traffic accident. He jumped out of his car and to see if he could help, someone yelled, Does anyone know? CPR. Nervously, Gordon answered, Oh, I do, and stepped in front. The m- there was a man on the ground who appeared to be unconscious. Gordon told someone to call Triple O and quickly examined the victim. He checked to see if the man was breathing and found nothing. Gordon knew that he was supposed to administer quick breaths and force the ma- air into the man's lungs. At that moment, he, the reality of the situation hit him. What am I doing here? He wondered, I can't do this. I don't remember a thing from my silly CPR class. Gordon backed away for several seconds to collect his thoughts. That's when he noticed just how dirty and disgusting the man was. There's no way I'm going to give mouth-to-mouth resuscitation, Gordon decided. Then the gravity of the situation overtook him. The man was dying and Gordon had to do something. Gordon knelt down, cupped his mouth over the man's and began giving him quick breath. He checked for a pulse and found that the man's heart was still beating. He checked for breathing, still nothing. The man wasn't getting oxygen. Gordon, Gordon gave, him four more, uh, gave him more quick breaths. Dozens of onlookers encouraged him, and some of them even prayed. After what seemed like an eternity, the man came to and the ambulance arrived. You see, when we think of it like CPR, it's never a waste of time. I have people say, well, I go out so many weeks, so many days this week. Can I encourage you to commit to six weeks of one session a week? It won't be a waste of time. It'll give you words. It'll give you inspiration. It'll give you heart. It'll reveal to you a spirit perhaps you've never come across before. How many times do you hear and you sit in a group of people and they say, I just don't know how to share the gospel or... Or this person asked me about Jesus and I didn't know the words to say. You've heard Luke's testimony this morning about just the opportunity that God gives us, divine appointments I call them, of opportunities just to speak into people's lives. It's never a waste of time. It won't be a waste. I can guarantee it won't be a waste of time. If we look at what the scriptures say and they encourage us even more. In 2 Timothy to find it in my notes here, I've got so many. In 2 Timothy, it talks about it. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, who correctly handles the word of truth. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Years ago when we were a young married couple, We hosted a home group at our house, a life group at our house, and the pastor of the church at the time decided that he had to be present at every Bible study group because he needed to make sure we were all on track. Don't worry, that's not going to happen with me. I trust you. Anyway, he came around. It was a hot summer's day, and I came out in the single. And we sat down like I do because I'm a blokey bloke bloke. And his wife sat there like this. Douglas, please go put on a shirt. And I went, oh, why, what's wrong? You're not present, not presentable. Please go put on a shirt. So I went away all embarrassed and put on a shirt and came back down and sat down. I was rebuked. I don't care what you wear to your home group. If you want to come in singlets, you can make it a singlet day. It's a bit cold in winter. 
But folks, when we get into a situation where we open God's word, there is going to be times when you feel like, is God having a go at me? There's going to be times you feel like, hey, yeah, I'm on the right track. There's going to be times you're going to feel challenged and go, you can do better. That is what God's word does. I would encourage you, if you can commit to that for six weeks, just see what God can do in that context. In Romans, uh, sorry, in Ephesians 2.10 it says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. I was watching a clip from being put up about Teen Street this morning and they were talking about the throne room and they had just snippets of the teaching throughout the week for the five days. One of the young people said on there, she said, I've been coming, this is my fourth year. After my second year of coming here, I was challenged about the mission field, not just my local community, but actually challenged about the mission field. She said, this is my fourth year. She said, I'm going on a mission soon. That young person, through going to the groups that she was in, the life group she was in at that convention, was challenged by God. Don't think that you can sit and allow the Holy Spirit just to wash over you and not be challenged, not be confronted. You are God's handiwork. He's prepared stuff for you to do. How else are you going to find about it unless you're in his word? And some of the challenges that will come out of Romans out of the, the studies you do, I'm, I just it's going to be good stuff. It's going to be great. Third one, no water pistols allowed. I know what you're thinking. Pastor Doug is hanging up his Nerf gun. That ain't going to happen. Let me read you another illustration I think is absolutely fascinating. The Danish philosopher Soren Kiergaard once wrote about a town where a fireman lived. Everyone liked the fireman because he was a nice guy. He made it a habit to be gentle and kind, which was usual for firemen who were supposed to be tough. There was a fire one day and the fireman charged to the scene of the fire with his fellow firemen and heavy equipment. As they came towards the fire, much to their surprise, they encountered between themselves and the flames about 200 townspeople, each of them standing there with a water pistol aiming at the fire, going squirt, squirt, squirt. The fireman asked, what's going on here? A spokesman for the group turned and said, well, <sighs> we, are all, we all appreciate this wonderful work you're doing in our community, and each of us has come to contribute in some way to your work, squirt, squirt. The fireman said, I don't get it, you're all crazy. Oh, we realise that we could do more, couldn't we, folks, said the spokesman. But most definitely, said everyone, but we just want to offer this token of our support. Squirt, squirt. You don't know what you're doing, shouted the fireman. True, you have to appreciate the fact that everyone is willing to offer whatever help they can, said the, the spokesperson. And everyone said, Amen. Squirt, squirt. At that time, the fireman shouted and said, Get out of here, you guys. This is no picnic. This is a fire. And a fire doesn't require well-meaning people who come to make small contribution. A fire is a place where people come to give their lives. Your commitment to God is not about making some small contribution to make yourself feel good or just think that's the best I can do. I think that God will challenge. I believe God will challenge you in the next six weeks. I believe that as we take these things into account, that it isn't a place to make well-meaning contributions. It's about a place of participating and contributing. It's about a place where people come to give their best, which is always what we should do for the kingdom of God, even if we're not doing this in home group, even if we don't come to church or very often, but we come to give our best and first to God. In Genesis, the challenge goes out. And Abel also, uh, also bought an offering of fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But God is never disappointed when we give him what we think we should. But he is overjoyed when we give him our first and our best. In every aspect of our life, if we give God 
our first and our ble- best, we say we honour you, God. We think you are important. You know the story of the missionary, don't you? The missionary who came back to share with the church family. And as she was finishing up sharing, she said, I'd just like to thank everyone who sent over their tea bags. They were second hand, but they were only used once. Someone in the church family had used their tea bag and said, I'll give these to missionaries. I won't waste them. You know what they could have done? Bought a box of tea bags and given them the first and the best. Folks, God desires the best for us. Can't we desire the best for God? Personally, as you walk with God, think about how can I do this better for him? How can I be the best one? I was challenged years ago by one of our church leaders who was talking about the finances of the church. And, you know, he said a couple of words that made so much difference in my life. He said, I know people hate talking about money. He said, I've got to say this. He said, when you set aside your money for God, what's the priority you do that? Do you do it first as soon as you get paid or do you make sure you pay your bills then pray, pay and put away some money for God? Or do you spread your money around and, and do the kingdom of God thing? The words rang true to me because to me it was about getting things in the right order. Tree and I vowed from that day on that we would give God our first and our best. And we are so shocking at it that we decide to do direct debit. <laughs> so we just, as soon as our pay comes and it goes across, without even flinching. Some people say, well, you're not controlling it. Is, is it really giving? But God knows our hearts there. Folks, when we come into a situation where we can have an opportunity to participate in something new in the life of the church, can I ask you for your first and your best? Can I say, don't give me excuses? Can I say, don't find some way out of it? Can I say, look, where do I sign up? How can I do this? How can we as a church do this and grow together? Because one of the things that's laid upon our hearts, and I shared this with Darren the other night, is that I feel this is about unity. I feel it's about being one in together. Not a, a project, but a spiritual walk as one. I want to encourage you with that. No water pistols allowed. You can say that as you walk into the home group. No water pistols allowed. You might even have home group shirts with water pistols with a big cross through them. Yeah, no one's smiling. Okay, move on, Doug. One more illustration to just to encourage you about home groups. And this one's a little bit out there and I'm just going to go for it anyway because I really believe God revealed it to me. Being hands-on. There was a college professor and he was in charge of an environmental science group and they were going on this big outing into the hills and they did lots of trips into the mountains. And after doing this a few years, he realised he could do something before they even left. He got all the students in a room that were going. There was about 20 of them, I believe it says here. And as they were milling around, he said, OK, I just want you to do something. I want you to grab the butt of the person beside you. And they went, what? Maybe it's harassment nowadays, yeah? Just grab the butt of the person. You don't have to hang on for too long. Just grab the butt of the person beside you. So they milled around and milled around and milled around and did this for about half an hour. Some were offended. Some wouldn't participate. Some thought beauty. <coughs> and some, some really appreciated why they were doing it. He didn't explain. He just said that. Grab the butt around the person. Anyway, what happened was this. We're going on a steep, slippery walk, he said. Because of this, you'll have to walk in single file, hunched over using your hands and feet. If the person in front of you should slip, the first thing you'll need to do, the first thing you'll meet, sorry, is her butt, his or her butt on the way down. Have you ever done this sort of thing? This is so true. And to stop them from falling... You'll need to reach up and just with both hands and grab them to stop them from falling. If you're used to touching someone's butt, you might be tempted to, st- sorry, if you're not used to touching someone's butt, you might be tempted to step aside and let that person slide. And this would put him at risk, her at risk, as well as those beyond you. We've got to be hands-on. I don't mean for that to be the first thing you do in your home group. All right, everyone, let's do the whole butt grabbing thing. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. But the visual image of not letting someone slide is important and that's what it's about it's about keeping people on each other on track encouraging each other if someone says something 
You say, dude, shouldn't you be saying that? If someone says, oh, I'm so proud of myself for doing this, then you can talk about it. If they start to miss a night, you can ring up and say, yeah, okay, because I'd love you guys to be here. We've got to be hands-on. It's got to be intentional. It's got to be part of who you are. It's got to be that instinct that I've got up on the screen. The instinct, your reaction will be to support them. Another word for that is called pastoral care. See, home groups, life groups, offer a great opportunity to experience pastoral care. It offers an opportunity to help each other out to walk along beside. A person can be isolated in a group of 100 people, but in a life group of 10, they can be a member. And they're still a member of the 100, but a life group of 10, they can be a member that is cared for directly. Because you'll talk to each other and you say, look, I, I'm really struggling. I've had, I can't come because I've got wisdom teeth coming taken out and they're just my face is swollen a great home group would say hey how can we help this person and one of the things you might do is let's ring pastor doug and let him know you might be able to pop around for an encouraging visit that's part of what a life group does it's not a, a microcosm in itself it's actually part of the greater group of the church in first thessalonians 5 11 it says therefore discourage each other with a big stick and tear each other down just in fact you were doing Ed Smith's not here. He usually follows all my scripture verses on his phone. <laughs> Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you were doing. Folks, I want to encourage you that if we get to build a community of faith, and worship team, if you'd like to come out, just I, ho I know it probably come across as a clumsy introduction. I pray that you've been encouraged. I pray that there's ways and you can say, well, let's, Let's think outside the box. There's seven groups up on the board. Only a couple of them have got times and days on them. The others are open to negotiation. Be prepared for an invite. Folks, let's just hit this run. Let's just really get into it. Let's really make it part of the life of the church. When we did 40 Days of Purpose back, I don't know, 15, 16 years ago, whatever it was, our church in Caboolture had three home groups. and There was about 300 people attending. Once we'd gone through and established this for just this short while, we had 16 home groups going. You know the coolest thing about the home groups? Is they weren't all the same demographic. They weren't all the same age. They were mixed up. And that was so awesome. Then after we did 40 Days of Purpose, a couple of the groups dropped off because that's what happens in life, but 10 stayed at least. Wouldn't it be great if a person come to this church, and you're a member of this church, come to this church and they come for a couple of weeks and they say, how can we get involved? And you say to them, hey, look, we've got a life group. Do you want to come along to that? Straight away they feel like they're part of the, f the community. It's a community of faith we're in, not a community of frivolousness. Can I encourage you about that? So a couple of things just to tie up with, and I'm going to pray in a moment, is that there's a connection between life groups and church life. It's not just a program on its own. It's going to be ongoing, we pray. Participation to contribution, that's what it's about. Be part of it to contribute to the kingdom of God. Look to encourage and support each other when you're doing it because that's how people grow. That's how people get on with things in their life. And you may come across something that someone's struggling with. You need to ring me and say, Pastor Doug, this person's struggling. Can you come have a word? Be prepared to either sign up or be invited. I'm going to challenge you, leaders of groups, don't just sit on your laurels. Think who can you invite. Age is no discrimination. Beck, you'll be able to fly back from Perth every week, won't you? You committed? Committed, Beck, thank you. Appreciate that, Beck. I'm just going to pray now and just ask God to, to really sort of Help us to understand Romans, to grasp Romans, and just do some exciting stuff. And Lord, we just give you thanks that, Lord, that as Paul wrote this letter, he wrote it to people he hadn't even met. Lord, people that had never encountered his way of looking at Scripture or his desire and passion. Some were believers and some weren't. Father, for us today, we stand before you with humble spirits. Lord, we desire to do things for you. Lord, we desire to see your kingdom extended. Lord, for the glory of your sovereignty over all your creation. 
Father, over these next six weeks, Lord, just give the preachers inspiration to share the word. Lord, the leaders discernment. Father, for groups to be encouraged. Lord, that others may know that we are your disciples. Lord, we thank you and praise you for your gift of Jesus Christ, our Saviour, who died on the cross for us and was risen again. Lord, that sits on the right hand of God, that we may have eternal life and victory over sin and death through Jesus. Lord, we leave this to you. Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy. Amen.